recording and open it up to everyone and, and give it a few seconds to let folks roll in from the public here. Um, Start about 10 seconds or so, that'd be great. Okay, we'll give a few, a few minutes here. Michael, do we have anyone on now? Uh, no one's on right now. So, um, and by now uh, I've opened it up. So if folks were online, they'd be here by now. So I think we're okay. We better text Doug and see if he's okay. So Doug actually showed up at the chapel thinking it was in person. So he is riding his bike back home to get online. So he might be joining us um, <laughs> shortly. There's, there's a couple of folks that have joined right now. So we, we do have a couple of folks on at the moment. So, Mayor, if you're amenable, um, I'm sure Doug has a comment, but we might can come back to him um, in yep. between agenda items. <laughs> okay, well, I will call the meeting to order. We'll start with public comment. If there is anybody on the line, Michael. Yeah, if, if anyone would like to make a public comment, please uh, hit the raise hand function in Zoom and I'll ask you to unmute yourself. I think we're okay to, to continue. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, first, I'm gonna ask for approval of the minutes. Um, could I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Second. Thank you, all in favor, just raise your hands. Okay, next we have the community committee report, Shauna. Good morning, Mayor and team. Um, just a few quick updates and I'm gonna read them so I stay on script. We have, um, we have as community committee uh, started to work towards developing our three task force and they'll begin meeting next month, which again are gonna focus on equity, park partnerships and cultural interpretation of the park plan. Um, we will also be uh, putting forward recommendations from community committee members for special assignments to help with the bond outreach with the chamber this summer. So we'll have a list of those names for you all next month to present. Uh, we're also asking community members to help support volunteering at major events this summer so we can have a presence to engage with the community at large this year. And the next community committee is April 19th at 6 p.m. in person. Anything else, Kate, Nick, Brody? Great, thank you. Shauna, what are the three committees again? We're focused on equity, park partnerships, and then the cultural interpretation of the plan. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Any questions of Shauna? Okay, we will get on to the Play Plaza update. Great. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's good to see you on this beautiful Tuesday. Um, we are having amazing weather right now, so I hope you get out to the park at some point. Um, I am going to share a uh, update on where we are with the Play Plaza and um, present a, a few items for discussion. Uh, so first, just an overall project update. Um, I figured it would be good just to keep track of all the projects that are going on so you understand where we are in the cadence of, of all the project schedules. Um, for the Gibson Play Plaza, we are entering into 90% construction documents. We have received our first round of site plan review comments um, and are going through those. Uh, the Lake Wheeler Road Improvement Project is in early stages of design and we're working um, in partnership with Engineering Services Roadway Construction um, on that work and uh, can provide an update at a future meeting. The Rocky Branch Enhancement Project, we're uh, contracting the next phase of work. Um, we're also finalizing the contract for the building and site analysis and should be running that this week. The anchor feasibility study, you'll see that will be one of your agenda items for the April meeting. That's also um, more commonly referred to as the marble study. And so we'll present an update at your April meeting on that final report. Um, we have successfully contracted with the Development Finance Initiative at UNC School of Government, and we'll be holding a kickoff with them um, mid-April along with the design team. Um, as 
as Shauna mentioned, we are kicking off the cultural interpretive planning process and are in the process of reviewing RFQs that were submitted for that. Um, and we're moving into some early building abatement and demo work. So that is uh, the bid packages for that are being um, compiled today. What I wanted to focus on is the Gibson Play Plaza with just an update on where we are and some longer term considerations for the project. So as mentioned, we're, we're moving into 90% uh, construction documents. The design is locked in and right now it really is about the refinement of the details um, and the design team producing the construction documents from which this will be built. So it's a lot of, a lot of detail work right now. Um, and one of the, the milestones, the 90% CD milestone really is kind of this um, final moment where we're double, triple checking everything before the project goes into full permitting and bidding. Um, so it's a, a pretty busy time for the project from the design team as well as the construction management and parks team. One thing I wanted to make sure everyone understood is that once design concludes and the project enters bidding, um, engineering services, the division within engineering services called construction management will lead construction administration. So this is a department within the city that is highly experienced and skilled in leading construction projects and they will take over the project um, once it enters into bidding and work directly with parks more as a client and with our construction management team and I'm sorry, our construction manager and our design team overseeing the construction of the work. Um, and I'll, I'll check to see if they've been able to join us. But one of the things that we've been having recent conversations about, and David, this is not unlike what you were sharing earlier, is that this is kind of an unprecedented time in terms of construction costs across all sectors. Our construction management team joined the state building conference a couple of weeks ago, and what they're seeing is steady escalation in a number of different cost categories, an extremely competitive market for labor, strained supply chains as a result of COVID, and then this um, conflict that is also cause, causing a lot of shipping and manufacturing, gas price increases. And so all of that is um, resulting in higher escalation than previously seen on, on projects. What that means for us specifically is that um, the city is seeing kind of escalation across all projects. Uh, our design team and our construction management team are going to work to identify cost mitigation strategies. And that could be um, strategies that include buying more product up front and locking in prices. It could be things that include working to um, schedule things out so it's a just-in-time approach. Um, and it also is cost mitigation in terms of value engineering. And so what we propose as a team is that perhaps there's an opportunity or a need to have a special meeting of this committee to talk about the play plaza construction process, talk about some of these larger impact and budget considerations, just so this group understands how we're moving from design into construction and some of those, um, I would say, bigger picture items that we all need to be aware of as, as the project continues to evolve. Um, that would be a, a special meeting of this group that would be led both by our construction management team, but also with parks. We'd also have our construction manager there to answer questions. But as we move into uh, this next phase of work, we thought it'd be a good idea to focus specifically on that. Um, I want to pause there and just see real quick if anyone has any questions about what we're seeing in the market. Um, let me see if Priscilla was able to join us this morning. I don't see her yet, but any questions or general reactions to the information on where we are with the play plaza currently before I kind of move into um, how we're going to keep everyone engaged and involved and um, the de decision making framework as we move forward. Orange. Uh, Kate, when would you propose having that leadership meeting? How, how soon? Yeah, so we're talking about that. I think uh, 
it, it would be within the next two months. And the reason we're saying that is I, we'd like to have that conversation before we get into full on kind of construction so that everyone knows kind of what to expect, how we're going to communicate to this group, how we're going to communicate out to larger stakeholders. And so we can have a real honest conversation about where we are in terms of budget as well. And, and then my follow up question is, are there buildings already identified that are going to be uh, demolished? And, and can you share those buildings? Sure, yeah, these are, uh, these are buildings we identified uh, a couple of years ago, actually. They're smaller cottages that are under the city's control. Um, it also includes the demolition of one of the structures in the play plaza site that we decided not to retain, so the Benner House. So this is not anything new. It's just we're finally getting this work going. Thank you. Um, Carlton. You're on mute, Carlton. Yes, you're muted. Yeah, that's usually a good thing. Um, <laughs> thank you and your team for trying to get uh, ahead of this. Uh, those of us who work in this, uh, share your concerns about this. Um, I don't think that I'm speaking personally and not as any expert. I don't think there's any question that the play plaza project will cost at least 10% more than it's currently budgeted. The only question is it going to be 15%. And so if we understand that and believe that your comment about term value engineering, because that typically means dumbing down. Um, and it would be a tragic mistake from this day forward to try to save money by dumbing down. Um, will you come to this special meeting with uh, a host of options already uh, for us to consider, such as buying the job ahead of time and trying to get away uh, from uh, construction cost increases? Yeah, let me share. Um you're setting up our next discussion very well. So <laughs> that was not planned, but let me share kind of with what we're thinking about in terms of a um, decision-making process. And then I'll come back to uh, our communication strategy. So across the course of the project, there are going to be smaller decisions that are very routine that we're going to need to entrust the design team and the construction management team to, to make real time to keep the project on schedule and, and things moving forward. So these are small material changes, small replacement changes due to product availability, things like handrails and fence types. Um, and we would consider those kind of very routine business decisions. There might be other decisions that either have an impact to visitor experience, a major material change, or a significant impact to project budget. Uh, this could be something, for example, of, uh, like going from exposed aggregate to concrete or a reduction in the amount of play equipment. These are big decisions. So what we're proposing is kind of a, a two-tier approach. Um, if the decision is routine, that isn't going to have a significant impact on project budget, visitor experience, or quality, we would like to keep all of those decisions within the design team, construction manager team, and the core city team to keep the project moving and on, and on schedule. If there is a significant impact on project budget, visitor experience, or quality, there's a separate decision-making path. And so what we would, what we would uh, suggest is that Am I still there? Can y'all hear me? Uh, Kate, you kind of froze for a minute there. So. Awesome. Yeah, okay. Kate, when when you were getting to the meat of this is when we lost you. Um, so 
I think if you go back to just, okay, there's two different decision-making frameworks. Um, and that's when we lost you. Okay, um, sorry about that. So the two, the, the two pathways are the routine decisions we would keep within the project team. So that would include the design team, the construction manager and the parks and construction management core team. Um, that way the project's kept on schedule, on budget, and those routine decisions are made at that level. Um, if there's a decision that has an impact on project budget, visitor experience, project quality, um, there would be a different decision pathway that would include the conservancy, this committee, and ultimately council um, in terms of, of direction there. So we are thinking about the conservancy as a partner in this discussion. Um, and when needed, would elevate those decisions appropriately to make sure the, the right decision makers are at the table to, um, to, to steward the play plaza project. Kate, I would have um, just, I want to echo what Carlton said, um, you know, from a value engineering perspective, you know, this part of the park needs to be a showcase. It's going to be what enables us to move forward in terms of raising money. Um, it's going to be the public's view of what Dick's Park is going to be. And I would be very reluctant to um, cut funding for anything that's going to impact visitor experience. Um, having said that as well, um, as we look at construction, if there's an opportunity to look at phasing, just in terms of when we can get product, okay, turning that around, um, nobody knows and nobody can really predict what the supply chain issue is gonna look like. It could be worse than we could ever imagine, in which case we're gonna to have to make some decisions, perhaps about timing of the opening, as opposed to cutting back um, on what we believe is critical to the success of the project and the experience. So I, I think all of us on this call need to realize that we don't know what we're dealing with yet. And the unpredictability of that might force us to make some different decisions. Yeah. I see Jim's hands, hand raised. Yeah, uh, Mayor, good morning. The, um, how, um, when, uh, Kate, when will we, go to contract on the project? I mean, when will we get our price? Right, so um, the, the plan right now is that we will be, uh, so there's kind of a, a, a two-phased approach to the work. Um, and Stephen, please feel free to jump in here. Uh, the idea is because council fronted this $12 million, um, and you'll see we're gonna, request funding from the Conservancy to supplement that 12 million. Um, there will be a first phase of contracting this summer. So um, contracting and bidding in June, July, um, led by our construction management team. That will probably, that will be at the a $15 million price tag because that's the money we'll have available to us at that moment. Um, the second round of contracting will be after the, um, hopefully the bond has passed and the full project budget amount is, is realized. So the, what our construction manager is doing is they're looking at things like long lead time items, um, items that might be more susceptible to price increases over time and front loading some of that purchase in that first phase of work. So a, an example of that is play equipment. Um, and, so the idea is that can we almost buy some assurances on the front end because we are front loading the project um, to help mitigate some of these costs with costs and risks with the unknown and escalation uh, over the project horizon. But Jim, directly to your point, 
we'll be contracting in May, bidding in uh, June, July with groundbreaking um, in late summer. Our um, development partners keep saying it's 3% a month increase in construction costs, which I can't believe. I mean, I can't believe that, but uh, it's, is this right? It's costing us a million dollars a month to not go to contract. Right, so if we, if we look at the escalation costs. Yeah, however we can. Uh, I think so, the other thing to, to recognize, and this was really interesting, and our construction manager pointed this out, pointed this out to us, um, the, the materials we're buying for this project are, are not, you know, we're not buying a lot of steel. Steel right now is really expensive. We're not buying, you know, we're buying landscaping materials, play structures. And yes, there are costs associated with those and shipping and all of that. But a lot of the costs that the market is seeing, um, wood, steel, I'm speaking, I'm speaking third person here because our construction management team has all this down, but um, we're not, we don't have a lot of those materials in this project. And so it's a, it's a really nuanced discussion, but we are seeing and we are going to have to plan for some significant escalation um, over the project horizon. And so the idea is what can we buy up front, lock in those, those prices, and then what will we, what can we get the subcontractors to do to kind of honor those prices over the, the project horizon? Well, how soon after the bond can we go to contract? So we're gonna be ready immediately. So the idea is that all of the upfront work is, is ready to go so that we can um, contract like very quickly after the bond passes. So the construction management team is putting together a schedule to look, you know, like the documents will all be already be ready. It'll be a matter of just bringing that to council for approval. Thanks. Stephen, I, I saw, I, were you gonna add something? No, you, you actually covered it. What uh, Belfer Beatty said is that we're not, if we were building up a, a high rise building, we would be in, pretty tough water. So we have a lot of concrete, a lot of earth moving material or grading. Um, and, uh, and then the play equipment, um, we're, we're, we're looking at a specific kind. So the ability to lock in those contracts because it's an international fabricator. So, um, but you, you, you covered that, Kate, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you. Kate, are you ready to jump on to Dreamville? Um, I just have a couple more slides on Play Plaza Communications, just on how we're gonna keep um, everyone up to date. So I'll share those and then we'll, we'll shift to Dreamville. Um, so during construction projects, parks, um, while the project be, is being managed by engineering services, parks maintains a very strong communication plan um, with all stakeholders. So parks will be responsible for uh, updating and be the, being the main point of contact for the Conservancy, other state community stakeholders, and we'll keep people abreast of the project in a variety of ways. So email newsletters, web updates, social, media spots, construction cams, video production. We have a whole suite of tools that we will use to keep project partners and project stakeholders um, informed and up to date. And just in, as, a, as an example, um, one of the things that we did with the Chavis project is um, had regular kind of updates, video updates that the construction company um, provided. So similar to kind of what you're seeing here is what we would do for the play plaza. Is the video playing? Okay. Um, so just as an example, this would be something we would do during key moments of the Play Plaza project. Um, that being said, we know that there is a lot of interest from the Conservancy and potentially the donor community to continue to have more access to project information and project updates. 
So another thing that we are planning on is kind of a, a regular schedule of site walks and coffee talks where the Conservancy and others um, can be present on site to hear directly from parks and the construction management team on the status of the project. So this could be site walks um, and, you know, breakfasts out on site just to make sure that everyone who wants to be informed is kept informed as the project, project unfolds. Now this is, is different from kind of the, the liaison, the construction liaison we mentioned in the decision-making framework. Um, and so we'll work with the Conservancy to identify a person or, or team of people that would want to be more engaged at the decision-making table um, when decisions around kind of the, the value of the project or the project budget uh, roll around. But that's our general communications plan. It's worked very well um, for all of our projects to date. So I just want to make sure everyone feels confident and and how we're going to share information as this project unfolds um, with the community and others. So any questions around that? Hey. Um, Kate, uh, this is Nancy. I just have a, I have a question and it actually pertains to the leadership committee. This you suggested us having a special meeting with the do we have that in person? <laughs> And I was just wondering if, if there's thoughts of when we're going to start having this in person. I just, I know there's obviously we've needed to do Zoom, but it, it feels like when we have in-person meetings, we have better conversations. And... Yeah, I can work with the, the mayor and manager's office on that, on kind of the schedule of when we want to return to into in-person meetings. Okay, thanks. What we discussed was boards and commissions would start meeting in person again in April. Is that us? Yeah, okay. that, would be, okay. that would be April. Okay, thanks. Um, so the one last item I wanted to bring up, and I mentioned this is for us to kind of start this project in earnest, um, we, uh, the city has already agreed, you know, fronted $12 million. So city, city council allocated $12 million to get the play plaza project going. Um, in, in discussions with our construction manager at risk, he really suggested that a $15 million project start budget would be ideal to help us mitigate some of these risks and buy some of this product early and so what we are coming to the Conservancy for um, is a funding request for $3 million to finalize the construct or to supplement the 12 million, I guess not supplement, add to the 12 million for a total of $15 million to start construction on the Gibson Play Plaza. Um, this request, we can basically through our existing funding agreement, we have a, a way to do this, a mechanism to do this, but the, the way these requests happen is I present them to this group, the leadership committee, and then the leadership committee um, makes a vote and or recommendation to the CEO of the Conservancy to, for that request to be presented to the board. So what we're requesting is uh, $3 million uh, for the CMAR contract for a total of $15 million to start construction of the play plaza and then an additional 2 million for the additional project startup costs, which includes, for example, the NBBA's construction administration fee, early material testing, some additional hazard material abatement work, but this would be um, the, the funding request that would come from this group to the Conservancy to get the Gibson Play Plaza going this summer. Uh, so I want to stop there and see if y'all have any questions, but uh, Mayor, this would be a staff recommendation for this group to, to potentially vote on today, um, and I have a slide that kind of articulates that recommendation, but before we go there, are there questions around what we're requesting and why? Hey, could you take down the um, sure. presentation so I can see everyone? Thank you. Um, Janet has a question. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, so 
Kate, you're are you requesting six million dollars in like April or just could you be specific? I know we had said the three million. Is this just if you could clarify the total amount and when? Yeah. So the three the three million is needed in April to finalize the construction manager's contract. Um, what Janet, we can do is look at when we need the additional two, and then the one million is, I think, for people that are closer to the project. There was this idea of purchasing stone early, um, and that that would be a direct conservancy purchase credited to the project, but donated to the project. And so we can talk about the timing of that. Um, but the, the 3 million for the CMR contract is needed in that April timeframe. And then I can work with our construction management team to understand the timing of the additional two. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Kate? I, I just have a question. I thought this, the CMR was part of the original estimate on the whole project or part of the $12 million that the city had allocated. Why is that a separate item now? I'm just confused, I don't. Um, so the CMAR, when we talked with the construction manager, um, 12 million bought us a certain amount of things, but they really said if we wanna mitigate some additional risks, 15 million, would help us, for example, like buy the play equipment early, buy some additional long lead times early, long lead time items early. Mm -hmm. So that 15 million was like the sweet spot to get the project going in earnest. Oh, for the, summer. So the CMAR is suggesting 15, okay. I thought it was 3 million, that, that's what we were paying the construction. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, it's a part of that. Yeah, this is for budget. materials and other things that we can buy um, up front, hoping that we can offset some of the cost um, that's expected. And um, Nancy, it does include some of the, the construction manager's fee in that number, but it is only relative to the work they're doing at this phase. Okay. Um, Kate, do you need a motion on this? We do. So the staff recommendation is that the leadership committee approve the funding request, and then we uh, share that funding request with Janet to present to the board of the Conservancy for review and discussion and approval. Okay, do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Second, David. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, that looks like um, unanimous, except I can't see Jim, but his hand's there. So I'm assuming Jim is voted for this. Um, thank y'all and Janet, I'll work with you on the request and the timing of the funding so we can be clear on that. Um, okay, uh, hey, this is Jim. So uh, overall, <clears throat> uh, the idea was that the Conservancy was going to do 5 million for four years. Am I right about that? Um, but I'm saying, not really different. Uh, wasn't that the plan? What What are you thinking, Conservancy? How will the Conservancy fund the twenty million? Okay, right. So, um, what we're going to do in addition to this funding request is, um, Stephen. Tansy, our attorneys, Janet, others, we're working on the longer term funding agreement, which would outline the, um, the longer term funding of the play plaza and how that is scheduled out over time. And so we're start, we're gonna schedule meetings to do that. Um, this was an early ask 
and it's, you know, it's credited to the overall amount that you're donating, but this is an early ask so that we can get the project going this summer um, and not wait on the negotiation of the, the next funding agreement. But Jim, I think what you're laying out is the exact discussion we'll need to have for the funding agreement, um, the next round of the funding agreement. Okay. What we're asking for, Jim, is um, upfront, kind of what the city is doing with the 12 million. Um, again, to get ahead of this and, and make sure where we don't have to go back to value engineering and that we can move forward as quickly as possible. Good. Mayor, I think Janet had a question. No, I. I was just going to say, I think the original plan was something more like, you know, 6.6 .6 million over three years because we knew everything had to be paid ahead of the 2024 ribbon cutting. Um, and I, now to the mayor's point and, you know, Kate's given the high inflation, I think anything we can do to be helpful in locking in costs, we will, we will certainly uh, work with you. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have our Dreamville update. Morning, everybody. Joey Vasco on the Dix Park team. Hope everybody's having a good Tuesday. So um, I get to take the, the event and operation side of the conversation this morning and provide a, dream, a Dreamville update for everyone, just to make sure everyone knows about all the details about the exciting festival coming to the park. Kate, if you don't mind bringing up the slides, that would be great. So um, as everybody has heard, and I'm sure is aware, Dreamville will be returning to Dix Park for its second run um, in, in April, on April 2nd and 3rd. So Kate, okay, you can go to the next slide. So the Dreamville Music Festival is a two-day festival this year, like I said, April 2nd and 3rd, 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. each day, and the attendance this year is estimated to be at 40,000 people. So there's just kind of some overviews around the event. I'm sure many of you saw the festival lineup announcement that Dreamville made a few weeks ago highlighting all of the different artists that'll be part of the two-day festival. Again, very excited that J. Cole will be the headliner on Sunday. You know, as, as we all, as a lot of us know, I'm pretty sure all of us know, this festival has been very important to J. Cole because of his roots here in North Carolina and the Fayetteville and the Raleigh area. So having him back would be, will be great. So some of the highlights for the festival this year and, and kind of responding to some of the challenges from 2019. The first is there, the festival has a new concessionaire, which one of the biggest feedback from the public was um, the folks that attended the event is that there were extremely long lines for concessions. So the, there is a new concessionaire this year. As in 2019, there's several incorporations of local businesses through food and art throughout the festival. There are several local food trucks that will be present. Also, Art Explosure is a partner of the festival. You'll see a lot of their different um, installation pieces if you are able to come to the event. There's also new decor items that'll be at the event. Very excited about a large Ferris wheel that'll be in the middle of the big field um, for Dreamville. So being able to kind of enjoy those new pieces. Also just lots of different art and kind of decor pieces around the festival grounds. Um, also the hammock grove that is on the big field that many of you have enjoyed and seen will be incorporated into the event as part of the festival. There'll be some really interesting and cool uplighting in that area, incorporations of that in a ticketeer called GA Plus that folks will have access to those hammocks. So we'll, we'll all kind of be part of those, those pieces. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Just kind of a big picture of kind of how the festival will be laid out right in the middle of the image there. You'll see the big field, you'll see things highlighted such such as kind of towards the top um, is the main stage, again, called Rise and Shine again this year. So the main stage kind of near the top of the image, near the bottom is the second stage. Um, some new additions this year, there will actually be a third stage as well in the southeast corner of the festival that will feature some uh, additional artists and some BJs. One of the ch one of the challenges or one of the things the uh, event organizers identified is kind of once you got down that hill in 2019, it was pretty quiet and felt disconnected down on that section of the big field. So they've worked to activate that area as well. A lot of the same things that you saw in 2019 will be located in the same place from VIP areas to where the artist will be staged. And I think I saw Kate's um, mouse kind of over the hammock grove area that we were referencing that will be incorporated into the festival as well. 
So just to kind of give you a big picture view of what the festival kind of layout will look like as build starts later this week into the weekend. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So one of the aspects we're very mindful of and we work very hard to communicate to the public is the impact on Dix Park due to Dreamville. So as you can imagine with this large festival coming to the park, there are some impacts. So just to highlight some of those, Dix Park will be closed to the public from Friday afternoon at 6 p.m. through Monday morning um, as the festival happens. So basically what this means is all of the park entrances will be closed to the public during that time period and only folks that have credentials to the festival will be allowed on the park grounds. Also, our chapel facility will be closed on Saturday and Sunday as well to the public because the whole park is closed. Um, there's a, a longer impact to the big field itself because if you didn't get a chance to see it in 2019, the, the big field is kind of turned into this mini city where the festival takes place. So the big field will be impacted all the way from later this week through Friday, April 8th. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Just kind of a visual as well around some of the road closures that will happen and some of the entrance closures. Everywhere you see in red will be roads that are closed or entrances that are closed um, during that festival time through that April 1st evening through the morning of April 4th. The yellow is a road closure that will happen around the big field itself as that build is happening on um, the big field. So that big drive area in yellow will be closed all throughout the build on the field. And then you'll see in green, Centennial Parkway is impacted. The, the two evenings of the festivals um, on April 2nd and April 3rd, as that area is closed for uh, shuttles and egress from the event, rideshare pickup. So between Oval Drive and Achievement, Centennial Parkway will be closed. So there's been a lot of engagement and notification happening with the surrounding neighborhoods and um, businesses that are impacted then sharing this map, making sure everyone is aware of these road closures and these impacts so folks can prepare accordingly, ask questions, all of those aspects. So a lot of that coordination has been occurring. Okay, you can move to the next slide. From a from a, a attendee perspective, here's kind of a graphic that shows how you can park or how you can use rideshare or scooters or any of those aspects to get to the festival. Um, the festival is, works with our NC State partners to use parking on Centennial Campus as one of the main parking areas. You'll see all of those parking kind of options outlined on this map. Also, folks have the opportunity to park downtown in our parking decks and ride a shuttle from Moore Square. So Moore Square serves as the main downtown shuttle kind of bus pickup drop off area to and from the festival. Also in 2019, we saw a large number of rideshare um, operations and folks using, using rideshare to come to the festival. This year, the festival organizers have expanded to two rideshare drop-off and pickup locations. Kate was just outlining those with the map, one off of Centennial Parkway and one on the east side of the campus near the chapel. So those operations are there. Also, the um, event organizer ha have been and ride and bike share folks and just the biking community in general, so that if folks bike and scooter to the park, there are designated drop-off locations for those bikes and scooters. Also, as in 2019, there is a regional shuttle program that takes place. So if folks are coming in from Greensboro, Charlotte, other areas, they can take a regional bus. And finally, there's been some coordination with Amtrak on how folks can ride the Amtrak train to Raleigh and then come over to the festival as well. So lots of works, work around different opportunities on how people can get to the festival and then get to the park itself. Hey, Joey, just real quickly, I, I did want to note, um, we've been working really closely with the state farmers market and uh, understanding there, that will actually be staffed by festivals to make sure people aren't parking there to ensure we're not impacting state farmers market and really appreciate David, the, the team at the farmers market work with us on that. And then just another bit of thanks to Alicia and the whole team at NC State um, working with us to, to ensure festival success. Yes, very well said, Kate. Without those partners, these large events at Dix Park do not happen. So we absolutely appreciate the coordination there and the, the willingness to work with third party organizers and the city on these high impact events in the area. So thank you, Kate. Go to the next slide. So I wanna ask Captain Bond from um, the Raleigh Police Department to kind of join us. He's gonna talk about some of the safety planning and some of those different aspects that are happening on the public safety side of things. Good morning, Captain Bond. Good morning, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, so from a public safety uh, standpoint, um, so we do have a solid uh, public safety plan, um, including uh, law enforcement, fire, and EMS. Um, we have several law enforcement partners, uh, you know, not only the Raleigh Police Department, but we'll have uh, Wake County uh, Sheriff's Office uh, helping us out and State Capitol uh, Police Department that will be assisting us with uh, everything from crowd, uh, crowd control and site security, uh, traffic, and any type of uh, emergency preparedness to respond to any uh, critical incident that may happen either on site or in, or in close proximity. Um, EMS is our uh, you know, medical partner, so we have a solid medical plan uh, with them. Uh, they'll be bringing in some additional resources from uh, other counties working under a uh, mutual aid agreement to provide uh, medical support um, to, uh, to the event and uh, surrounding uh, areas. Uh, in addition, uh, the other law enforcement agency also that I forgot to mention is uh, NC State Campus uh, Police Department. Um, as Joey mentioned, there's no on-site parking at the, the park, so most of the parking that we'll be utilizing will be on Centennial Campus. So uh, NC State Campus Police will be facilitating the security piece on the campus. Um, however, we will be assisting with the traffic impact um, on the streets that uh, lead up to the campus. Um, and then obviously the fire department, they will be um, a part of the public safety piece as well. There, there will be pyrotechnics during the show. You know, we'll have uh, the big Ferris wheel. So there will need to be a, a plan um, in case there's something, something goes wrong with that. Um, so we have a, a pretty solid plan that we're comfortable with. I think the biggest impact is going to be the traffic impact. Um, you know, 40,000 people trying to come to this event, um, and that's 40,000 people per day. Um, so so 40,000 people coming to this event, um, even though it's going to be staggered entry, um, it, it, traffic, there is going to be a significant traffic impact. There's just no uh, way around that. We're doing it. We have a plan to do everything we can to minimize the traffic impact but there's no way to totally eliminate it. Um, a lot of the messaging that we're putting out in advance is that uh, for people coming in, driving in from out of town, is to take, uh, if you're coming in on I-40 westbound, um, to take the Lake Willow Road exit, and if you're coming in from I-40 eastbound, to take the Gorman Street exit, and that will uh, eliminate everybody from taking one exit ramp in order to get to the, uh, to the property. Um, the other thing that is, is going to be more significant is, and for our locals at least anyway, is uh, there is not going to be any uh, entry from um, Western Boulevard. Um, so there's no, uh, any, the only entry that will be allowed onto the property from Western Boulevard is going to be the ride sharing uh, that enters from uh, Boylan Avenue. Um, and that's it. Um, so you know, that there will be a significant traffic impact on Western Boulevard just from our locals um, that just think that they can, can, can access the property from Western Boulevard. Uh, all of our walking paths um, will have uh, light towers on them. They'll have a police presence on them um, as far as the Rocky Branch Trail. Um, and then we will have roving patrols in the Boiling Heights and Carolina community that we think might see an impact from the uh, crowds, whether they're walking from the downtown area or parking at various locations in the Carolina neighborhood. One thing that we noticed in 2019, um, some businesses along Maywood Avenue uh, uh, allow people to park for a fee on their property, which uh, led to a lot of foot uh, traffic um, uh, along the uh, Maywood Avenue corridor. Um, so we'll have some additional presence uh, there to uh, make sure that you know, we continue to provide a safe environment and then they'll be able to cross over safely um, at a makeshift crosswalk at um, Lake Wheeler and Good Street. Um, so I think I think that's the, the biggest thing for the, the public safety standpoint. Um, you know, we have a, a solid plan in place. We have an emergency action plan in place. Uh, we're finalizing some of our um, emergency responses to um, weather-related events, if we have to do an evacuation, what's, what's that going to look like, uh, and things of that sort. Um, aside from that, the road closures during egress, um, we'll probably will start implementing those anytime between um, 8 and 9 o'clock. 
Um, so Centennial Parkway between uh, Oval Drive and Achievement Drive will be completely closed so that we can stage uh, downtown shuttle buses and so that we can stage uh, ride sharing, Uber and Lyft um, within that road closure on Centennial Campus, uh, on Centennial Parkway, I'm sorry. And that way when egress happens, when people start leaving, um, their rides will be there and hopefully that will expedite the, uh, the egress process. Um, I think that's it. Was there anything else on that? If you could put that slide back up, Joey, or am I missing any other topic on that? No, Captain Bond. I mean, you definitely hit the highlights. There's a couple more slides and then we can kind of open up to any questions or comments at the end. Um, before we move forward, I just want to say thank you to all of our public safety partners on behalf of the park and the city. Captain Bond has worked tirelessly on the planning for this event with everyone in RPD and others, and we just could not do these events without their cooperation. And we have July 4th right on the heels of Dreamville as well. So we're, we'll be counting on public safety and our partners such as NC State and the Farmer's Market and all of our kind of partners around the park again. So thank you, Captain Bond. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So <laughs> um, hopefully everyone has received the information, but the Dreamville Festival organizers invites everyone to attend a special sneak peek of the event on, on Friday, April 1st at 2 p.m. It's, it was very, it's very neat to kind of walk around the festival footprint with the event organizers to kind of see everything behind the scenes. In 2019, if anybody participated, it was pouring rain. So hopefully this year we won't deal with the rain, but um, just a great opportunity to kind of walk with them. They can kind of, kind of paint the picture of what the festival will look like um, at that event. So hopefully everybody can, can join us for that. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions about the festival. I'm sure uh, Captain Bond can answer anything from a kind of safety traffic um, aspect as well. Hey, Orange. Yeah, Joy, um, I don't know how you guys prepare for this, but how do you estimate how much time it's going to take to make over from Saturday night in preparation for the Sunday event? How many people are going to be out there cleaning up and, you know, that's that. That is huge. <laughs> yeah, that we we actually specifically talked about that because, or it's like you're alluding to, this year it's new where we're going to have a two day event. So there's a lot of plans from, I've seen plans on kind of how they're going to go through the parking lots and do the porta johns and do the whole field. There's a massive crew coming in overnight to do a major sweep of the festival grounds between Saturday night and Sunday, and then the same has to happen Sunday night into Monday because this campus has to be ready to go for DHHS operations at 6 a.m. on Monday morning as well. So we've been stressing to the organizers of saying, hey, you know, not only do we have to flip between the two nights, we also have to flip to make this campus look amazing on Monday morning as well. So there's a lot of coordinated efforts, efforts that are happening there. We've been working with organizers to identify all those areas that need to be touched in both of those scenarios to make sure that we're good to go. But you're absolutely right. It, it is a massive undertaking to make sure this is a good experience for the attendees between Saturday and Sunday, and then for the public in DHHS on Monday morning. Hey, David. <laughs> yeah. David. Yes, thank you. Uh, Joey, as you know, with the State Fair, we have that issue to go on night after night after night to clean up, be ready for the next day. Who are you using for that? Because I'm, there's someone new out there. Uh, I, I certainly would like to know who it is, uh, although the, the company we've been using is a nonprofit out of Durham, Trosa. They're wonderful, just wonderful. So I, I just wondered who you were using. <clears throat> David, I'd be happy to find that information and share it with you. So that's actually being contracted directly with the festival organizers. Mm -hmm. So I could get I could get that information and definitely share it with you. Okay, thank and you. I know it's a concerted effort between kind of the cleanup that's happening at the park versus like the cleanup that's happening on Centennial Campus as well as I'm sure Alicia, Alicia will attest. There's also a massive kind of organization around making sure parking decks and all the areas on Centennial Campus look great as well. So there's a couple different entities involved there, but I can share that information. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions of Joey? Well, I just wanna say thank you to Alicia and David for working with us and all of our partners. Um, and as Arj said, Joey, good luck. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be a massive undertaking and we're really excited to bring back Dreamville. It's gonna be great. Absolutely, Mayor, if you'll allow me just for a second, I just wanna also just call to mind, you know, just the wonderful economic impact this event brings to Raleigh as well. I know in working with Visit Raleigh and 
DRA partners, they're very excited about the, the visitors coming into Raleigh from all over the United States and from other countries and just that opportunity to really influx back into some of our local businesses as well. So just so many different great opportunities, not only from exposing the park and our local businesses and just bringing folks in that have maybe never come to Raleigh, North Carolina before to experience this event. So we could not do this without all of our partners. So again, just wanna say thank you to everyone. Great, thank you. Okay, next we have our Dix Park Conservancy update, Janet. Thanks, Mayor. Um, well, I guess uh, we've been spending a lot of time with many of the partners that we're talking about in our, this call. So I appreciate all the good conversations we have been having and the time everybody's dedicating to this park and the programs in the park. Um, I guess just hearkening back to Kate's presentation, again, we are, um, I think, excited, obviously, about the groundbreaking this summer, excited about the fact that we've got that $12 million advance and want to get up to speed. I think we have some education, you know, and learning to do um, on interfacing with an engineering services and understanding um, the players and but are looking forward to that next phase. So certainly welcome uh, in person or however we do it this this meeting. And as you know, we've got so many talented uh, folks with large scale construction experience at the Conservancy that I think um, are both interested and can add um, value here. So, I mean, Carlton being one of them, but um, looking forward to that. Um, another partner not present, you know, the chamber uh, starting to really gear up on this bond campaign. We have put forth some names uh, to Adrian Cole at the chamber. Andrew Blackburn had a few conversations. So we are um, definitely, you know, eager to get going there. And uh, I understand there's been a poll, you know, out in the field. Um, so look forward to chatting with that at the appropriate time and place and understanding how we all sort of promote parks across the city and make sure that the bond is successful. Um, obviously still wanna work with everybody on making, you know, what that bond package is um, as you uh, process polling data, you know, have your internal negotiations about that package. So, um, Please, you know, just know we we remain uh, on standby and uh, want to be helpful there. Um, I think all of this conversation just uh, we've been talking with you know Tansy and the finance and legal department that um, you know getting together and trying to solidify and put pen to paper on the financial financials um, over the next three and a half years. Uh, we are also. Um, ready to do that. I know Bill Ross, you know, who's helped work on the MOU, um, you know, will be there and others. So there'll be a lot of continuity as we go into that conversation on the financial agreement. And then finally, um, we are still, you know, uh, very excited about the other uh, possibilities of moving forward at the park, um, stone houses, which I think will be on the next uh, agenda, other ancillary buildings that, you know, DHHS is still occupying that we are in conversation with them. So, um, yeah, I just, a lot of conversations with a lot of partners, but um, that's the, we do appreciate, um, I guess I uh, should note uh, on this call, you know, the, the Wake County, a uh, million dollars through the federal recovery funds for the park to enhance usability and access for all the citizens of um, the area. And we were really appreciative and um, we'll work uh, hand in hand with the city on that. Um, so some exciting um, fundraising still going on as well. Okay, any questions of Janet? Okay, um, we'll start the around the table discussion. Does anybody have anything? Just raise your hand. Uh, Nancy. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, a couple questions. One is a follow up. The last time we met, we talked about the conservancy in the city having a work session together. I don't know that, I don't know what the conversations at the city have been, and I don't know if anybody has brought that up. Anybody? Um, you know, has brought that up at, at council, but we're certainly very interested in having that and looking forward to that. And one of the things that has been mentioned 
multiple times um, is I think you all know that the city of Raleigh Museum is interested in moving when their um, lease is up to Dix Park as is the rest of the world. You know, everybody wants to be on Dix Park and that's fine. And one of the things that we talked about in the master plan was an African-American cultural center or African-American interpretive center. I mean, it, the program itself was not really defined. Um, and then, you know, there, I've heard that there've been discussions about doing that, some sort of program around that at, at Top Green, at Top Green Center. But there've also been some discussions about the possibility of linking those two programs together. The, if the City of Raleigh Museum is going to move, um, certainly all of our history is connected and nowhere better connected than through Dix Park. And I think that that really lends itself to some consideration, just some uh, amazing possibilities. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up. If we could have a work session with the council, um, I, I know how much fun booking things out is, and I don't know how far out you all's <laughs> council meetings and work sessions are or booked, but I think that could be a really interesting and productive part of a work session for all of us. So I'll I'm leave that sure. up to Kansi to, um, we'll discuss with Marshall when she returns from vacation. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, council Member Branch did make a formal request um, at a council meeting, and so there um, it, we do have it as a pending item for work session. Uh, Janet and I and Kate um, have had some general um, conversations about the best timing in terms of opportunistically um, uh, slating that work session at a time that, um, like the, to your point about discussion about um, potential tenants and strategies with buildings, trying to, to um, do this at a place where there's meaningful feedback or, or progress to, on the, um, Play Plaza and also on some of the other studies that are just beginning. So um, we'll continue to coordinate on that specific timing, but yeah, it is on our radar to get that scheduled. Thank you. Carlton? This may be a little longer range, but there are a number of history initiatives at Dix that all of us take seriously. There's uh, the actual history of the hospital and the people that were there. There's the prehistory of the hospital going back to Native Americans and enslaved people. There are various legacy concerns. And all of this, as you point out, is one history. And I wonder, is there at some point an opportunity to lay out all of the history aspects of this and weave them together in a seamless building and a seamless program? Um, <coughs> that would not be a little building here and a little building there and a little space there because it's, it's, it's a big issue across the whole part of the park. And it seems to me that they could all be integrated and they'd be better financially and culturally and from a visitor experience to sort of have a big bang in that way. So just off into the future, somebody might think about that. Thank you, Carlton. Any other questions yes. or anybody have? Okay, Jim. Mayor, thank you. Uh, just two or three things for the next, for the next meeting. Uh, at, oh no, first, ground building is really important, right? And getting, uh, getting the ground building and getting that done for the opening is like uh, a very important part of what's going on. Um, the uh, uh, we would be interested in um, what the the budget is going to be for the uh, Dix department. That is, is the city uh, staffing up that department? Uh, looking forward to uh, building it and opening it and managing it and. Um, We've also been talking about how soon we could get the, um, the manager for the play area 
uh, in place. Uh, we, we've had the uh, recommendation from several places that the sooner that happens, the better. And if they're in place during construction, uh, lots of problems can be uh, anticipated. Uh, so, you know, we, we got the budget we, that we need uh, for the uh, to build and then to prepare to operate the park. Can we get a manager in sooner than later on um, on marbles? Kate said it was going to be on next month's agenda. It would really be helpful as we talk about this for marbles to give us tell us if everything worked like they wanted it to work or if everything worked like we wanted to work. What would the schedule be? Right, it's hard. We, you know, they think it'll. They have to sell their building. They have to raise the money. They would want to start construction when that is. The timing It's hard to think about marbles if you can't think about marbles when. And I, I, and I don't know if we should hear from the county about, about marbles, but that's uh, so that, those are just the things that I've been thinking about. Number one, the, uh, the Brown building. And then maybe we can get a report uh, from uh what y'all plan to do uh, what 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 money will be in the bond issue for dicks so that we can uh our committee can have some discussion about that and uh duke's going to win the next game there Hey, Kate, you got all of that, I, I saw. All right, anybody else? All right, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, got a phone call two weeks ago from Congresswoman um, Deborah Ross and the funding for the Strollway project from Dix to Chavis has been included in the um, omnibus bill. So um, we will be getting funding for the project so when you talk about history, it really does connect the history of um, Dix and Chavis and will also provide a convenient um, way for people to um, access both parks. So we're really excited about that um, internally and um, anxious to get moving on that. So that was good news. If you see Deborah Ross, please tell her thank you. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I am going to adjourn the meeting. I wanna thank everybody um, for being here. And um, next month we should be meeting in person. So um, it'll be good to see everybody um, instead of on a screen, actually look at your faces. So thank you so much and everybody have a great, great week. Thank you.